All right. So again, welcome to our first uh, Warrior Wednesday uh, presentation of the fall 21 semester. Uh, we're going to be talking today about resume and cover letter writing. Um, my name is Jessica Donner. I'm the coordinator for career and professional development. Um, in my role, I meet with students one on one and through group presentations about career readiness. So that includes resume and cover letter writing. Um, we can talk about mock interviews and interview preparation, networking. I can help you with your LinkedIn profile. Um, so pretty much anything that you would need uh, to be successful as you prepare for uh, post-graduation employment. If you're looking for an internship, we can help with that. Um, or if you're considering graduate school as well, we can help there too. Um, so today uh, we're going to be talking um, about resumes. We're going to talk about an overview of resumes. Um, we'll get into the different types of resumes that are available to you uh, to use, and then we'll talk about some of the nitty gritty. So we'll get into formatting, what to include on your resume, how to write accomplishment statements so that you stand out in a competitive applicant pool, and some tips and techniques that you can use on your resume so that you can make sure that um, your information looks good and compels employers to call you for the interview. We'll also be talking about cover letters and some best practices for writing those. Um, so to keep our um, attention together today um, and making sure that we are interacting with one another, I'm going to ask that you go to menti.com. So www.menti.com and enter in the code uh, that you see here on the screen. So 16442283. And this is going to allow you to share with me um, and the rest of the group um, your um, resume writing level. So um, you can talk with us about or tell us about, um, do you already have a resume? Do you feel confident in your resume writing? Um, or do you have a resume and it needs a little bit of um, TLC, maybe, um, or do you not yet have a resume and are needing help with uh, filling one out? So go ahead and choose um, the uh, resume type that you have. Okay, we have the one that has a resume that's looking for a little TLC. All right, we have a resume writing pro amongst us. Okay. And we'll give everybody else a, a moment. You're able to join us on Menti and add your uh, resume writing. Um, while we're going through our presentation, as you're all um, adding your answers to menti.com, um, one thing I'd like you to know about is the chat box, the chat feature in our GoToMeeting today. If you have a question and you don't want to turn on your microphone, you can always add it to the chat box and uh, we'll take a look at it, make sure that we address your, your questions there. All right, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about resumes. So we've got a resume writing pro amongst us, congratulations. Um, and we also have some uh, that are having a resume but need some TLC, so we can definitely help with that. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about the types of resumes that we have available and what exactly a resume is. So by definition, a resume is a brief account of your education, qualifications, and previous experiences, typically sent for a job application, but you might find that there are other opportunities um, that you will need your resume for. Some um, entrance uh, requirements for higher education will require a, a resume. If you are applying for an internship um, or if you are applying for some volunteer opportunities, depending on the level of volunteer uh, work that you would be doing, it would require a resume. Um, and it should be a brief account of your education, qualifications, and experience that are going to be relevant to the position that you're applying for. Some things that a resume is not. Let's go ahead and bust some myths about resumes. Uh, the first myth that I'm going to bust for you is that there is a one size fits all resume type or format. So this is absolutely not true. There are a number of resume formats that are at your disposal. We're gonna talk about the three most common uh, resume types that are available to you uh, to apply for general employment. We will not have an opportunity to talk about federal resumes today 
or CVs, uh, but we will be having additional workshops throughout the rest of the uh, semester. If you're needing some more um, timely information about those, you can absolutely reach out to us um, and we can talk about those. We can schedule an appointment and talk about your CV or your federal resume. But um, there is no singular type of resume uh, format. Um, every resume is just a little bit different because every person's skills and experiences are just a little bit different. So um, keep that in mind. Another resume uh, myth that I'm doing the best for you is that a resume is meant to get you the job. And that is simply not the case. Uh, the resume's purpose is to get you the interview. You are going to get the job through the interview process, but your resume is meant to get you the interview. So what that means is we want to make sure that we are showcasing your skills and experiences that qualify you for the position that you're applying for and compel the hiring manager or decision makers to call you for the interview. And then through that process, you're gonna get you the job. So uh, two myths that I'm gonna go ahead and bust right away are that there's a one size fits all resume type or format and that uh, your resume is meant to get you the job. Those are just myths. So what are the different types of resumes that you have at your um, disposal and how would you use them? First, I'm gonna to talk to you about the most common type of resume. This is gonna be the reverse chronological resume. Um, in a reverse chronological resume, you would list your work history in reverse chronological order. So you would start out with your most recent um, work, visit or, um, work experience and work your way backward in time. Um, generally, your um, reverse chronological resume will have a professional summary or an objective statement or skill section, but it's not required for the reverse chronological resume. Um, you would showcase your education either at the top or the bottom of the page. So our example here has the education at the top of the page, but this section could also be at the bottom of the page. My recommendation for where your information appears on your resume is going to be based on what you want the employer to see first. So my rule of thumb is lead with what qualifies you for the job first. So if your education qualifies you for the job, have it at the top of the page. If it's your work experience, lead with that instead. You definitely want to have both on the page, but where they fall on the page is going to be up to you and how you're going to lead that conversation with the employer. Any questions? So far, I don't see any in the chat, but again, you feel free to turn on your cameras or your microphones if you would like to ask a question. No, nothing yet? Okay, so let's talk about uh, functional resumes. So a functional resume, unlike your uh, reverse chronological resume, is going to highlight your skills versus your work history. So. On our previous example, we had our experiences listed out in reverse chronological order here. Um, on your functional resume, you're going to highlight your professional skills in greater depth. Um, Michelle's asking, does education always go at the top? No. Um, again, my recommendation is to lead with what qualifies you for the job first. So if your education is gonna qualify you for the position, uh, so maybe you've been working towards your bachelor's degree in um, human resources management, but most of your work experiences have been um, in a different industry. So maybe you're changing industries or you're a new professional. You could lead with your education because that's going to be what qualifies you for that position first. If you're applying for a role, maybe you've had a couple of different positions throughout your career like me, um, and your experience is going to speak for you and qualify you for the job first, you might have your experience section at the top and then follow it with your education. Great question. Okay, so uh, back to functional resumes. A functional resume is gonna highlight your skills. So um, on our reverse chronological resume, it's going to have bulleted lists for each of your experiences. Whereas um, on a functional resume, you're going to have a bulleted list for uh, skills that you're highlighting to the employer. And these are gonna be the most relevant skills that you have that you're bringing to the position that you're applying for. Generally on your uh, functional resume, you will have an objective uh, statement that includes um, your experiences and some of the skills that you're bringing to the table. And you will also generally include this areas of experience section. This is gonna highlight some additional skills with less detail and briefer statements about each of the skills. So these can be technical skills or soft skills that you're using in each of these roles. Um, and then finally, 
you would follow it with a brief list of your work history if applicable. So if you don't have a work history, you can include sections such as um, uh, awards and accolades. You can talk about clubs and organizations that you're a part of if you've done any research. So there's a lot of different types of information you can include on your resume and we can certainly explore that with you if you wanted to come in and meet about um, how to highlight your skills and talk about um, some of the additional sections that you can include on your resume. Michelle's asking, some experiences don't have bullet points. Can I explain that? Yes. So <laughs> on a functional resume, you would have bulleted lists for each of the skills that you're highlighting um, in your professional skills section. So um, you can draw from different experiences in your life, whether it's work experience, experience in the classroom, extracurricular activities, volunteer work, you can draw from all of those areas in your life and write accomplishment statements. We'll talk about more accomplishment statements in a moment, um, but to really describe how you gained that experience or worked um, to build that skill that you're highlighting for the employer. On a functional resume, you wouldn't necessarily go into a bulleted list for your experiences because you're highlighting the skills. Whereas on your reverse chronological resume, you would have three to five bullet points for each of the roles that you're including there. Great question. Okay, so let's talk about our last uh, resume type that we're gonna go over today. Um, and this is going to be the combination resume. So this is going to be exactly what it sounds like. It's a combination of features from the reverse chronological resume and the functional resume. So on your uh, combination resume, you would generally include a professional summary and the skill section. So these would be brief skill statements about your soft skills and technical skills that are going to be relevant to the position that you're applying for. And then you're going to follow it up with a, a brief work history in reverse chronological order here. Like your reverse chronological resume, you're going to have your bulleted lists or your accomplishment statements um, living underneath of each of the roles that you're including on your resume versus the skills. So on a reverse chronological resume, and your combination resume, you're going to write accomplishment statements for each of your work experiences. Whereas on the functional resume, we're really going to spend more time talking about your skills and writing accomplishment statements, drawing from all of the different experiences in your life, the classroom, work, volunteer, and extracurricular activities to support where you gained those skills. Any questions about the combination resume? Uh, functional resume or reverse chronological resume before we get into some more of the nitty gritties about formatting and then we'll talk about how to describe our experiences. Okay, so I don't see any questions so we're going to keep moving. Um, I'm going to ask you all to go back to Menti with the same um, code that you used last time. And as you uh, consider the different types of resumes that you um, have seen today and the different ways that you could um, highlight your skills, what might be um, the resume type that works best for you as you think about the experience that you're, that you're um, wanting to include? All right, so we've got combination is leading. Okay, that's a great resume type because it gives you an opportunity to highlight your skills and also your experiences, reverse chronological. Okay, and then functionals um, heading here in the last. The functional resume is a really wonderful opportunity for folks that have little to no experience um, or maybe changing industries um, and don't have a lot of experiences in the industry that they're, they're going into. So professional students or folks that are um, kind of going from one thing to the next um, and really wanting to highlight the skills that they're bringing. And um, that's a really great one. The combination resume is my preferred type of resume because it gives me the best of both worlds. So thank you for participating in that. And let's talk about our resume formatting. Um, so we're going to get into some nitty gritties here. I will show you some examples, but I do want you to remember that you can ask questions in the chat box or turn on your webcams or your microphones and ask questions as we're going along here. Um, so let's talk about layout. So the basics of a resume layout, let's talk about length. 
Um, so I'm going to bust, bust another myth for you and say that all resumes must be uh, one page. That is absolutely not true. Um, I'm going to tell you with one caveat that um, you can go into multiple pages on your resume. The caveat is that anything that you include on your resume must add value to your application. So when we think about the goal of our resume is to get us the interview. So as we are writing our resumes and highlighting the skills and experiences that we think that qualify us for that role that we're applying for, we wanna make sure anything that's on the page is going to add value and support of that. Um, so if you start to go into a second page, that's okay. Um, you do wanna to try to fill up at least three fourths of the page. If you're finding that you're only filling up the first quarter of the page or a couple of lines on the page, you can do some changes to your layout um, to bring that information back up to the first page. So as far as resume length, it's okay if you have multiple pages, but you want to make sure that anything that's included is going to add value. Generally speaking, you're going to want to include about 10 to 15 years worth of experience on your resume. You may not have 10 to 15 years of experience right now, and that's okay. As you gain experiences throughout your career and you continue to add to your resume, you'll find that it can be difficult to fit 15 years worth of experience on one page. So it's okay if you go into the second page, just make sure that everything is adding value and you're filling up at least three fourths of the page. There are some things that you can do to save room on the page if you need to, such as margins. So when we're talking about the margins or this white space that surrounds the page, you wanna make sure that you are anywhere between one inch margin, which is a general margin, um, down to a half an inch. Anywhere between one half inch and one full inch um, is fair game. The caveat here or the rule here that I want you to remember is that you want them to be equal on all four sides. So if you do a three quarters of, of an inch um, on the top, you wanna to make sure that it's equal on the left, right, and the bottom as well. So equal margins on all four sides, anywhere between a half inch and one inch. I don't generally recommend going below a half an inch because there are some old school resume reviewers out there that still print out their resumes. And if they're using a general office printer, anything less than an inch might be cut off. So all that information that you worked really hard to include now was missing um, and they're not able to have a good interaction with your resume. So half inch to one inch margins, alignment. Um, with alignment, um, generally speaking, you're gonna wanna have paragraph alignment. So on the left-hand side, there will be appropriate times for you to center align text or write align text. And we'll look at our example where we might do some of that. With your alignment, no matter what your choices are, you wanna make sure that they're consistent throughout the page. So if you have right aligned your dates at the top of the page, you wanna right align your dates throughout the rest of your resume. If you have left aligned the section headers for each part of your resume, you wanna make sure that they're left aligned throughout the rest of the page. So you're going to create expectations for the employer at the top of the page on how they can find the information on the rest of your document um, because they're going to be looking at a lot of different resumes in one sitting for each of the roles that they have. So um, by creating expectations at the top and following that same formatting throughout the rest of your document, they'll be able to quickly and easily understand how they can find the information that's most important to them. When we think about how much uh, space we have between each line, so your line spacing, so this little area between each line, go with a single space that will save you room on the page. If you do like a, a 1.15, I think is the um, default or those uh, spacing types that have an additional space at the above or below a paragraph, that just takes up unnecessary white space and can cause your information to move down on the page. So make sure that you're single spacing and that'll be a really great way for you to uh, save some room uh, while you're adding your experiences and skills. Some honorable mentions that I want you to keep in mind as well. Um, for your bullet points, um, go with a traditional bullet point, either a round bullet point or a square bullet point versus a special character. I say this because when you apply for positions online, whenever you press submit, your resume is often being imported into an applicant tracking system. What that applicant tracking system does is it scans your document, finds the information it's looking for, and then parses it into a software. Sometimes whenever you have special characters on your resume, no matter how smart these systems get, 
it may not understand what that symbol means and doesn't understand that it's a bullet point and may skip that information entirely. So now your information is being imported into an applicant tracking system and, you're in, and some of it's being missed because that parsing software doesn't understand how to treat it. It can also cause the information to go into the wrong place. Sometimes you have an opportunity to review the information before it's submitted and sometimes it happens after you press submit so you may not be able to catch it. So err on the side of caution and go with a traditional bullet point font. Same thing for images and icons. You may feel compelled by some of the templates that you see online to include a, a, a nice looking headshot of yourself on your resume. I'm going to ask that you don't include um, your headshot or any logos or anything like that on your resume. Again, because when your resume is parsed into an applicant tracking system, it doesn't know how to treat that image or that icon and it may and it's going to skip it entirely and any information that's surrounding it may be missed i also want you to refrain from using your headshot because you want to watch out for intentional and unintentional bias if you have your photo on your uh, resume a reviewer might see it and think oh i don't like that color on that person maybe you're wearing a cream colored shirt and they could say oh i hate it when people wear cream um, it seems silly that it can create an unintentional bias and now they're reviewing your resume with that bias. Let your skills and your experiences speak for you. Don't give the uh, reviewer an opportunity to uh, place any of their biases on you um, and show them that you're qualified for the job using your skills and experiences. Any questions about that? Any questions about layout or adding icons or images to your resume? Okay, so let's take a look at an example. On this example, um, highlighting for you equal margins again on all four sides of the page. Remember, you don't wanna have a uh, margin that's smaller than half an inch, and you don't wanna go any bigger than one inch. Uh, make sure that you have consistent formatting throughout your document. So on our example here, we have our dates right aligned. Uh, make sure that all dates would be right aligned. We also have our degree information bolded, so we're gonna bold our position titles throughout our document, creating those expectations for the hiring manager, how they can quickly find the information that they're looking for. We're using single spacing here, so we're taking advantage of all of the space that we have on our page here. It still leaves a very nice amount of white space around each of our sentences, making it easily read. Um, and then again, make sure that you're using traditional bullet points, so you can use a round bullet point or a square bullet point versus a special icon so that we can feel confident that your information is being imported into an applicant tracking system and not being missed. Okay, so let's talk about fonts um, and what your information can look like. So um, generally speaking on your professional document, you want to use a native font to the uh, word processor that you're using. So these are fonts that are automatically installed with the software that you're using. I have a list here of some generally accepted fonts. These are very uh, typical traditional fonts. This is not an all-inclusive list. These are my favorite to use on a resume for different reasons. So some of these are serif fonts, which means they have all these extra little embellishments on them, so all these little tails. So as you're looking through uh, fonts and making decisions, some of these uh, fonts that like have these extra little and embellishments, I don't know what else to call them, um, on them um, can take up more room on your page. So if you have uh, information and you have a one page resume, but there's still um, some considerable white space at the bottom and you they're already a 12 point font, you can choose a font that's gonna take up a little bit more room on the page. And I'll show you what that looks like in our next slide. Um, these are also going to be very easy to read. Um, so we don't wanna make any assumptions about our readers uh, vision abilities. So we might have folks that are using e-readers. So using a general font, um, those e-readers will be able to read them. If we're using a specialty font, like so a non-typical font, um, the e-reader might see those as symbols versus text. And now um, they're not able to get the same information anybody else would be able to have. Um, and then also whenever we print this out, um, there's still going to be enough white space around each letter that it's going to be easily seen. Um, if we start to get into some of those fonts that have um, different weights uh, to each letter where half of it's bold and half of it's not bold and things like that, it can be difficult to see. 
So we want to make sure that we're not making any um, assumptions about our reader and that each person is able to interact with our information um, the same way. And I'm seeing a couple of, I'm going to ask person, are you here, here in the, um, in the meeting? I'm going to ask that you moderate the chat for me because there are a couple of questions that I missed earlier and I'm going to go back and take a look at them. Um, okay, so <laughs> Michelle's asking about punctuation on each of the bullet points. I'm actually going to come back to that because we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Um, thoughts on GPA. So um, whether or not you're including your GPA on your resume is largely going to be determined by if it's a requirement of the application. So sometimes when you are applying for a position, um, they have specific education requirements and they have GPA requirements. If that's the case, it's a good idea to put it there, but if they're requiring it, they're probably also going to ask you to include an unofficial transcript um, in your resume as well. Uh, so you wanna make sure that you're doing that too. But um, if you want to include your GPA, this is kind of one of those personal choices that you can make. If it's not a requirement of the job, you can decide if you have it there or not. Typically, I recommend if you have a 3.0 or higher, um, you can include it. If your resume, if your GPA is um, lower than 3.0, or if you're just starting out like I am right now and you don't have a GPA, um, I'm, I'm currently uh, in a new program and I don't have a GPA yet because I haven't completed my first class, I wouldn't include that either. So it's going to be um, a judgment call on your part, um, absolutely, if it's a part of the requirements of the job. All right. Okay, so back to fonts. Um, so we don't want our fonts to be smaller than 10 point in height, um, and we don't want it to be larger than 12 point uh, in height for the body text. Um, if you, for your name at the top of the page, you can make that a couple points bigger so that it stands out nicely. But um, generally speaking, throughout the rest of your document, you want your fonts to be consistent. Um, so no smaller than 10 point, no larger than 12. Um, and this can also help you save some room on the page. So let's take a look at a couple of different font types that um, you can use um, and some that you shouldn't use. So on our uh, do this column, these are some of the fonts that I have listed on our previous page. Um, so we, our first bullet point here is in Georgia. Then we have uh, Arial, Calibri, and Times New Roman. So you can see they're all just a little bit different, um, but they're very easy to see. And believe it or not, these are all in a 12 point. So even on your devices, however you're viewing the slideshow today, they're still pretty easy to see and read um, because of the shape of each letter. This is also a good illustration to see how some take up more room than others. So even though they're all 12 point font, these uh, two first fonts are a little bit bigger. So they're taller letters, they take up more room on the page, um, than these last two here. So if you're using an Arial font and you need to save yourself a little bit of uh, space, but you don't wanna have Times New Roman or a serif font that has all those extra little embellishments, you can use like a Calibri, which is still gonna be a nice round font, but it takes up less space. On our not this column, these are some of the specialty fonts that I have installed on my computer that I've used at one time or another. And believe it or not, um, the first and last bullet point are fonts that I've actually seen on resumes. These are also all in 12 point. And you can see how with our first bullet here, um, some of our letters are very similar. So o, o and E are read very much the same way. Um, and they're very scrunched up together. So if this was shrunk down to a 10 point font, you can imagine how that would be um, difficult to read. Our second and third font here are specialty fonts that are kind of like a script font or like a handwritten font. Um, again, very difficult to see and read. Um, this second font here is actually a specialty font. And if it was being read by an e-reader, it would be seen as symbols and not as actual text. So a person using an e-reader to understand the information on my document would not actually be able to understand what this says because the uh, e-reader would skip it. And then finally, we can see how having some different shapes in our letters can make it difficult to see. Again, if this was shrunk down to a 10 point font, it would be very hard to read. So make sure that you're choosing a traditional font, something that's gonna be easy to read on the screen and on a printout, anywhere between a 10 point font and a 12 point font. 
So talking about some tips and tricks before we get into our next piece here, whenever you are including information on your resume to go back to Michelle's question about punctuation, um, whenever you're writing your uh, resume, you wanna make sure that you're using proper sentence structure. You're gonna use the implied first person. So no I, me, or my on your resume. You're gonna use the implied first person, complete sentences, proper punctuation and grammar. When it comes to bulleted lists, um, if you have a period at the end of your uh, sentence, all of your sentences in your bulleted list will have a period. Because it's a list, you're not required to include that punctuation. But if you have it for one, you have it for all, um, or you could choose not to have it at all. Okay. Um, my recommendation, because these are going to be complete sentences and the way that I'm going to describe accomplishment statements in just a couple minutes, um, I'm going to recommend that you use punctuation at the end of your uh, bulleted list. Um, but again, that can be a style choice that you make, um, but make sure that you're consistent throughout. Okay, so let's go back to Menti um, and answer another question. This, this Menti has a separate code, so make sure that you're going back to menti.com and you're gonna enter in this new code. And we're gonna talk about what should be included on our resume. So this is going to tell us um, what information should you include. And so this could be things like a skill. Um, should this be contact information? Should you include education? Those types of things. So enter in as many uh, things that you can think of that should be included on your resume. We'll give everybody a chance to get back to Menti and enter in a couple of our answers. Impact statement, okay. What else can we put on our resumes? What other information might be appropriate to share with hiring managers and decision makers? Education, contact information, work experience, skills, accomplishment statements, and certifications. Okay, great. We've got LinkedIn account. Yes. Any other answers coming up? So generally speaking, uh, there are some things that you absolutely should include on your resume. Things like your contact information, so your name, a phone number, email address. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, education, if appropriate, if you have education that you want to include. Yes, um, your work experiences. Again, if you're doing a reverse chronological resume or a combination resume, you would absolutely want to include your work experience. If you're doing a functional resume because you don't have work experience and you're highlighting your skills, we could find additional um, opportunities to include things such as awards and acknowledgements. Yes, um, fantastic certifications for sure. So, okay, great job. So the answer to all of these um, things that you've included is yes. You would want to include those on your resume if it's going to add value to your application um, and if it's going to be relevant to the position that you're applying for. Educational and work-related achievements, yep. Detailed experience, skill, certification, educational background information, fantastic. Great job, guys. Okay, so let's talk about uh, writing your resume. So I'm just gonna go over some of the basics um, today, if you would like to talk more about some of the additional sections that we can include on a resume, I'm just going to go through some of the basic things right now, but we can absolutely talk offline after the workshop today, or if you would like, we can also um, schedule an appointment and talk more in detail about your specific uh, resume and what might be included. But to get started um, in the header or contact information at the top of your page, you're going to want to make sure that you have your name or your preferred name. So I have some uh, friends or I've worked with some students that go by a middle name um, and they don't use their first name. You could use your preferred name um, and you wanna make sure you have a good phone number for you, an email address, and I'm gonna recommend that you include your LinkedIn account, but we'll talk about that in just a second. So let's talk about email addresses. Make sure that you're including a personal email address on your resume. Make sure that your personal email address is appropriate. Um, so if you're applying for on-campus employment, it is appropriate for you to use your student email address, but if you're applying for off-campus employment or professional staff employment, even on campus, you would want to include a personal email. 
you want to make sure that it's easy to read, easy to type, and it doesn't include anything that's inappropriate. So we wouldn't want like bulldog72 at gmail.com. A good uh, go-to would be your full name. So Jessica Donner at gmail.com. You could do first initial dot last name at gmail.com or what, whatever domain you're using for your email. Um, if you have a common name and you're needing to create a professional email address, uh, you can include a number if necessary. So you could be jdonner82 at gmail.com would still be appropriate. Watch out for length. So um, my maiden name is a very long name. And if I were to include all that information, it would be too much to type. It's not a common name, so it's very easily um, misspelled. And so you want to make sure that it's going to be easy, concise, and appropriate. Um, thinking about your LinkedIn account, if you have a LinkedIn account, you should include your personalized LinkedIn link um, in your contact information. Um, in lieu of your physical address. I don't typically uh, recommend that you include your physical address um, in your contact information because it can spark unintentional bias. Also, you might be moving. So we have we live in a community that has a lot of military members that are PCSing in and out. Um, and so they might be applying for positions at their next duty station. You might be getting ready to graduate and deciding that you wanna move somewhere else. Or you might be comfortable with a commute. So you might be living in Colleen, but be comfortable commuting to Austin. Uh, maybe you enjoy having that extra time in the car to listen to an audiobook or get caught up with family using hands-free, hopefully, while you're driving to work. And so if you were to have Colleen, Texas, um, somebody in Austin, their thought might be, I wouldn't want to drive that amount of time. So this person might not either. And they're going to place their unintentional bias onto you. And so you wanna make sure that you're not including that. If you're moving, um, it can work against you. This person's in Texas. I don't have the ability to offer them a stipend to move, so they're not gonna want my job and they keep moving on. So um, I don't generally recommend that you include your physical address, but you should include your LinkedIn account um, link if you have one. If you don't have a LinkedIn account, we can schedule an appointment. I can help you with that. I can help you build it if you have one and it needs a little TLC, we can talk about that too. Um, but having your LinkedIn account will also be like a two birds with one click kind of situation. You're offering additional contact information for you. Um, and also on your LinkedIn account, you have the opportunity to include information that doesn't necessarily have a home on your professional document. So relevant coursework, um, recommendations from previous peers, things like that. Um, you, also, you'll be able to see that folks are clicking on your link viewing your profile so that you can connect with them and start to build your professional network. So let's talk about objective statements versus professional summaries. So an objective statement is going to be a short description of your qualifications um, that qualify you for the position and explain why you're a good fit for their role. Whereas a professional summary is going to be a brief statement that communicates career goals, um, experience, um, and include information about uh, goals or skills that you want to continue to build. You can use either on your resume, whichever is appropriate for you. And so we'll take a look at an example of each so that you can kind of get an idea of what those would be. So for an objective statement, you could describe yourself as a dynamic and motivated human resources professional with over 10 years of experience, seeking to use excellent communication skills as a recruiter at Texas A&M University Central Texas. So in the objective statement, we have our call to action here. Um, and if any of you are a good proofreader, you'll see that I have a typo in there. You get extra points um, and a free appointment with me. They're all free, but um, if you can point it out in the chat box. Um, so, but in at your objective statement, you would include a little bit more information about your experience and your skills, and you can include that call to action. In a professional summary, you could describe yourself as a recognized human resources professional with 10 years of experience in improving processes and programs that increase employee efficiency and performance, highly adaptable and dedicated to working with diverse teams. So in our professional summary, we're really positioning ourselves as a professional, highlighting some of the skills and experiences that we're bringing to the role. Any questions about an objective statement versus a professional summary? or um, our contact information on the resume. Okay, 
Um, make sure that you are feeling comfortable to add yourself to the chat box or however <laughs> was the typo. In my objective statement, I do not have ending punctuation. So watch out for that. Always have a second of, set of eyes, uh, review your professional document before you present it or submit it for an application. Um, okay, so let's talk about your work experience. So remember, uh, anytime you're including your work experience, you're going to want it to be in reverse chronological order. You'll include 10 to 15 years of experience and have three to five accomplishment statements for each of your roles. What accomplishment statements do is tell a holistic story to employers about a problem or task that you've worked on that is relevant to the position that you're applying for. Remember, we don't want to laundry list everything that we have done in each of our roles, but we wanna choose the most relevant skills and experiences that are going to help us to stand out in a competitive applicant pool. Accomplishment statements have three parts. You're gonna start out with an action verb. This is gonna capture your reader's attention and describe the work that you're doing. So things like manage, maintain, develop, oversaw. Um, following your action verb, you're going to describe the problem or task that you've worked on. Again, this should be something that is relevant to the uh, position that you're applying for. So how do you know what problems or tasks are going to be relevant to the position that you're applying for? My recommendation is that you use the job description that you're um, applying to as a guide. So if in the job description, they're describing somebody that should have excellent time management, team building and organizational skills, you'll want to reflect on your experience and tell a story about your time management organization and team, team uh, building skills or whatever it is that they're looking for that you have experiences with. The final piece of your accomplishment statement is going to round it out with the result or reason for doing the work. Anytime you can include an accomplishment, uh, a quantifier in your accomplishment statement, it'll help it to stand off the page and tell a more compelling story. So if you managed a number of people or inventory or budget dollar amount, you can include those numbers. Um, if you had a project that you worked on that resulted in a positive um, increase in a percentage dollar or quantity of something, you can include numbers as those numbers as well. Of course, um, you will always have those problems or tasks that you work on that don't necessarily have a quantifiable result. And so it's your job then to tell us the reason for doing the work, what was the goal for the task. So some accomplishment statement examples um, would be to conduct presentations to students. So that's a good example. That's I'm telling you what I'm doing. I'm conducting my action verb presentations to students. We can make it a little bit better by describing the presentations and adding a quantifier but we can really have the most impact in our best accomplishment statement example here by including all three parts. So we can say that we conducted presentations about services and professional development to over 50 students to provide career readiness tools and information. That's gonna tell a holistic story to employers so that they have a complete understanding about um, the problem or the task that I was working on. We've got our quantifier, so that's gonna stand off the page and keep their attention. So let's go back to Menti one more time. Uh, today and let's uh, build a word cloud together. What are some of the action verbs that you would include on your resume? So remember, these are going to be action verbs, capturing the reader's attention, describing the work that you're doing. Any words? So we've got a couple. We got strategize, manage, maintained. Any other? Led, promoted, awesome. Coordinated, applied, supervised. Delegated, wonderful. I'll give it another couple of seconds here. I'm trying to be mindful of our time. We've got some additional information to go over here. Anything else? All right, great job. So as you're um, continuing to add information to your resume, um, you would want to include, these are some uh, additional areas that you can include education, certifications and training. 
Again, like your uh, work experiences, these would be in reverse chronological order. You don't need to include your high school education um, if you have a conferred college degree or if you're working towards a college degree now. Um, and of course, you can include any additional certifications and training if they're current or relevant to the application that you're applying for. So um, if you are currently CPR certified um, and it has not expired, you would want to include that. If you have any additional training um, on specific softwares or um, skills, you can include those as well. If you have one that is going to expire, you could say uh, when it's good through some uh, certifications required continued education. So you would want to include that as well. And again, um, for your GPA, rule of thumb, if it's 3.0 or higher, you can include it, absolutely include it if it is required for the position. All right, so some best practices, and then we'll talk about um, cover letters briefly. Um, so you wanna use consistent formatting, make sure that you're reading the full job description and use it as a guide to help you decide which skills and experiences you're including to make uh, the most compelling story. So if they call you for the interview, always proofread before you submit it for an application and you can always schedule an appointment with career and professional development to help you out with that. Any questions about resumes? We only have a couple minutes left, so I'm gonna go through uh, cover letters fairly quickly, um, but we will share some additional information with everyone um, who has joined us today after our workshop. Okay, so let's talk about cover letters. So, and uh, what is a cover letter? A cover letter is going to be an introduction and is going to be attached um, or accompanying your resume for an application. Some myths that we're busting about cover letters today is that you don't need to include a cover letter with your resume. I'm gonna bust that myth right now. You should always include a cover letter with your resume unless it's uh, told to you that you it is not required. Um, sometimes whenever you're applying for a position, it doesn't always specify whether or not you should have a cover letter. If it doesn't say do not include a cover letter, include one. Um, and that you can use the same cover letter for every application. This is not true. You should be reflecting on the job description that you're applying for and customizing your cover letter for each application. You can have a general cover letter that you then modify for each application, but you would wanna make sure that you're adding that additional detail for each. So when you're addressing your cover letter, you wanna make sure that you include your full address and all appropriate contact information. You'll have two spaces between your address block and the uh, employer's address block. And then you would have the uh, full um, address for the organization that you're applying to. You would want to include the hiring manager's name if you have it. If you don't, you can address it to hiring manager or the department such as human resources. If you're not sure who to address your cover letter to, you can always reach out to the organization's um, human resources department and they can help you out with that. When you're writing your introduction in your cover letter, um, you want to include, wow, I have the same. This is why you have somebody else take a look at your presentation before you present it. But in your introduction, you would want to um, highlight the job that you're applying for. Ignore my bullet points, so embarrassing. Um, you want to highlight the job that you're applying for, and you would want to call out the organization that you're applying to. It's always a good idea to let the employer know where you find, found the job that you're applying for. So in our example, that it's listed on Hire Warriors. And then you can include some additional information about why you believe you would be a good fit for the job. In the body of your resume, you're going to grab the reader's attention by highlighting why the position is interesting to you. You wanna include information about your education, skills, experiences, um, and those types of things that are qualifying you for that role. So in our example, we're um, explaining that we've been academically focused on writing job descriptions, ethical hiring practices, and recruiting, since this is a human resources example. Um, and then finally, you're going to showcase your most relevant experiences and skills to express your interest in the position. So why these skills and interests are going to make you an ideal fit. And then finally, you want to end your uh, cover letter with a call to action. So you want to make sure that you are um, including information about how to contact you, the best information that they can use to reach you um, easily whether it's your phone number, your email address, or both, make sure your email address is appropriate and easy to read and type. 
And then make sure that you leave three spaces between your closing or sincerely and your type name and always have a physical signature. If you're doing this digitally, on, uh, you can uh, sign it using Adobe or something like that. If you don't have that capability, I can help you with that here in my office. We can do a virtual meeting and I can help you create a digital signature. So in your cover letter, the goal is, is to highlight the position that you're applying for, talk a little bit more about the skills, experiences, and expertise that you have that you're bringing to the job, why it's interesting to you, how you feel you will be adding value to that organization, and then always end it with that call to action um, that you're interested in discussing the position with them in more detail at their convenience. So that is the hour. I know that we got started a minute late, so we'll stay a minute late if you're able. What questions do you have for me? Feel free to turn on your webcams or turn on your microphones or use the chat box. Um, if you have any other questions, if you don't, you can always reach out to our office. We're at uh, cpd at tamucp.edu, or you can give us a call um, or schedule an appointment with us through Handshake.